Welcome to the Backyard Horse Enthusiast, where passion meets purpose. Today, we are honored to introduce a trailblazing expert in equine health and intuitive healing, Margaret Parsons. With certifications in equine sports massage, the emotion code, Reiki, and currently in the clinical phase of her osteopathic studies, Margaret has dedicated her life to empowering horsewomen to heal their horses using holistic, long-lasting solutions. After leaving her nine to five, Margaret tripled her weekly salary in just eight days, transforming her passion into a thriving business. Now she's here to share her journey and teach you how to unlock your intuitive abilities to support your horse's healing. Get ready to be inspired by Margaret Parsons, an educator, mentor, and healer on a mission to change how horsewomen connect with and care for their horses. But before we dive into this wonderful and exciting interview, let's hear a message from our sponsor, Shagbark Lumber and Farm Supply in East Haddam, Connecticut. At Shagbark Lumber and Feed, they've got everything your horse needs to thrive, from high quality grain and fresh hay to soft shavings and premium supplements, they've got you covered. Whether you're stocking up on grooming supplies or searching for the perfect feed, Shagbark is your one-stop shop for all things equine. Trust them to keep your horses happy and healthy, just like I do for my Dakota. Visit Shagbark Lumber and Feed today and experience the difference for yourself. Hey, Margaret, how are you? I'm good, Kimber. How are you? Doing well today. So happy to see your beautiful face here. And thank you for joining us on the Backyard Horse Enthusiast. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Well, I got to tell you, Margaret, I, you look really young to me. And it seems like you fit an impressive amount of things <laughs> into your life. Okay. Because... <laughs> According to this, and according to you, you have quite a few certifications under your belt. I may be a serial learner. That mm -hmm. may be a toxic trait. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. I mean, it works for me. <laughs> and the, the other thing that I read was that you transitioned out of your nine to five job into just full time equine work playing ponies all day like 10 year old little girl dreams over here <laughs> okay so I want to know for our viewers and for myself because I'm wicked curious and like I'm envious um how did that happen what was your motivation and how do other people do it there you go a lot of questions oh but they're good ones thank you thank you for that um so huh, what was my motivation I was tired of just having my soul sucked out of me every single day going to work. I was tired of it. And you know, in fairness, like <laughs> it was my first nine to five job. I got my first nine to five job um, somewhere in the range of 29, 30 years old because I had been playing ponies my entire life. Okay. So my parents have a standard bred racing farm. Racing is the family business. And they needed someone to manage the, the farm, manage all the horses. I mean, we had about 30 horses on the property at any given time, and we were working 17 of them a day, and they all have their own individual needs, you know, wound care sometimes, ugh, awful. Um, but then there's also nutrition needs to be managed, and every horse is an individual. So we're managing that, we're managing medications, we're managing training schedules, we're managing racing schedules. And there were days where half the family's going this way and the other half the family's going that way. And we each have our own rig full of horses and we're, it just has to be done. Right. So I have been doing that. Um, gosh, almost since the time I left high school, there were times, I mean, I had to establish my own independence. Right. So there were a few years there. I was like, peace out family. I don't need this. Uh, <laughs> you know, had retail jobs and they were always in upper management. And I mean, how could they not be after growing up the way I did? running yeah. so much, you know? Uh, and then 
you know, it got to the point where I was like, well, I did get a bachelor's degree in accounting and like, you know, I should probably use that. So I got a job being a staff accountant for, of course, a racetrack in the state of Michigan. <laughs> um, so I was watching ponies on TV and using the education that I had got. And it was a great job. Like I had great benefits. My schedule was flexible because I was a badass and I could do way more in a day than what was required of me. And I, yeah, I mean, it was great, but it also included being required to be in an office Monday through Friday. And my office didn't even have windows. Like <laughs> it was literally just like, I, I was, I felt like a horse trapped in a cinder block stall because my office was literally made of cinder block. Do I put horses in stalls? I do not, unless it's like absolutely necessary. <laughs> um, so I was feeling very trapped and I was really good at what I did, but it didn't light me up. You know, what made me feel good about it was everybody coming in and being like, wow, you're better at this than anybody that's worked here in the last 40 years. And I'm like, 10, four, thank you. Um, so, and being recognized in that way made me feel significant. I was at the top of a company. I came in out of nowhere and took over. You know, and that felt really good. It felt really good to be recognized like that. But it, you know, five years later, I'm like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. What am I doing here? You know, and I kept telling myself over and over that I don't have time to massage horses. I, I can't because I'm so worn out through the week that there's no time. I need my weekends to recharge. I have to have, I have to protect that space, right? We hear that so often. Protect your energy, protect your space. <laughs> Sure, for normal people, I guess. <laughs> I'm not one of those normal people. I actually, there was a fluke where somebody, a, a client reached out and they're like, hey, we found you on the internet and we've got five horses that all have some range of issue and we've done all the things and we just, we need somebody. I am who I am. I'm like, well, I don't have time because I can't give up my weekends, but also the ponies need me. So I went, I dedicated a day on my weekend that I was like, I can't afford to give up that time because horses trump everything priorities. <laughs> and what I learned in that one day of giving up, you know, my Saturday essentially and my two day weekend that's never long enough that I'm like dreading Sunday because Sunday means Monday follows, right? Um, I learned that horses light me up and they recharge me. So there was no excuse. Like spending that little time on the weekend was actually what I needed to get me to get make it through the week. You know, um, once I did that, once I realized that, I was like, okay, cool. So I can advertise a little bit. Like I can, I can try and get some clients a little bit because that was something I wasn't doing before. I was certified for years before I decided to even do anything with it because I kept telling myself I didn't have time. So once I did that, I, I didn't even get a whole lot of clients doing it because I was still, you know, I only have weekends and there's still family obligations that fall on the weekends because everybody is saving their weekends, right? Um, so, but I, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I was always looking into coaching. I was always looking to better myself. And I finally came across a coach that was more than anything that I had ever dealt with before. She was very intimidating and her program was expensive. And I was like, I can't do that. Blah. <laughs> um, but I got into some of her lower level stuff and things just started to really roll and what, what I really took out of it, like, yes, these are business courses, but what I took out of it was a level of self-assurance and self-belief that I did not have before. So you ask, how can anybody else do this? You need to believe in yourself just a little bit more every single day and remember why, why this is important to you, you know? So for me, it's always about the horse. Everything comes back to the horse. I can tie it back to being three years old and it's a little bit woo woo and out there, but not feeling like I wanted to be committed to this life on a soul level. Like my soul was like, I don't think I want to do this. Um, and when I brought horses in, when horses finally came into my life, which they were there and I just, I used to scream bloody murder as a toddler about horses. So something happened and I attribute it to my soul being like, we have to stay here. <laughs> we have to do this. We're here for a reason. And horses are so grounding, right? So at about four or five years old, I started asking for horses after not wanting anything to do with them for a long time. And so I, I come in and I, I get this, this grounding feeling from horses and all of a sudden I'm like committed, right? So everything to me revolves back to them. And they deserve so much better than what they get from us. 
And we don't see them and acknowledge them for what they are, which is sentient beings. They have emotions, they have feelings, they deserve choice. And it's taken me a lot, like my whole story is is not all, all about that. I did not grow up as the five-year-old who just whispered to horses and they did whatever she thought about. And it was so magical. It wasn't like that. I had to go through and learn the same way everybody else did and come back around to these are sentient beings and they deserve choice and they have feelings too. So for me, there's horses out there. I've literally saved their lives now. So there's no way that I can't do what I'm doing. And there's no way that I can't also encourage others to get on the bandwagon, find a way to lead. Like if you want to play ponies all day, you can do it. I do it. You can do it. Right. And we get to do that for them. We get to show up for them and show them that there's relief available and that someone is listening. Someone cares. Yeah. So that's why I do what I do. And again, if you want to do it too, you just have to believe that it's possible and you don't have to believe today and be like, I quit my job. And it's all, you know, it doesn't have to be all at once. It can be a very gradual process, but you already have the power to be a healer. And all you have to do is set the intention. So it just takes a little bit of belief. Wow. (laughs) I relate to every word you've just spoken. Wow. Yeah. Love it. Oh my goodness. And, and that leads me to my next question uh, that you had mentioned that in just eight days, you tripled your weekly salary after you left your job. What? Do tell. <laughs> How'd you manage that? It's easier than people think. <laughs> um, uh, it's a little, it's a little bit of that belief magic, you know? So um, as things usually do, I was really dragging my feet about leaving the job And yes, it was definitely, we can attribute that to belief in self and belief in process and also listening to all of the other people out there who are like, it takes years to develop a full-time business and you can't just expect to sweep in and do it. And there was a lot of that. And then of course, something happened where my boss and I actually got into a very verbally violent confrontation about the way things should be done and how we should handle things and the rights of other people. And it was in that moment that I was like, why am I still doing this? Why am I? I mean, I'm putting myself in situations where I'm being challenged in what I believe. And that's fine. I'm open to being challenged. But it's not something that I'm here to change the world about. This is not my fight to fight. I have one and I'm not doing it. So that was something else like about having the nine to five job. A lot of times people hesitate to leave theirs because they're getting something out of staying. And one of the things that I was getting out of staying was I was fighting for something. And in this case, it was how employees were treated and, and, you know, union rights and things like that, that I really don't give a shit about, but I know what is right when I see it. And I'm not going to back down from that. So on one hand, it was like, yes, I was doing good things, but this isn't what I'm here to fight about. I have, there's other things for me to be focused on. Um, So, but when we had that fight, I was like, I can't keep doing this. You know, I, I I noticed, I I just knew in that moment, like this isn't, this isn't for me. And that was in July. I ended up putting my two weeks in about a month ish later, five weeks, maybe. Um, well, maybe it was six weeks later. I don't know. The timeline is rough. Um, but I knew at that, at that moment. And in that moment, I was like, I'm done. The strategic planning started because I knew I was done. I was like, all right, what's next? I know that this, I need to build clientele up in order to maintain what we already have. You know, we had just bought a house the year prior and brought a horse home and like, yeah, uh, I got some stuff to pay for. (laughs) Um, And, you know, also my husband's like, uh, what about the insurance? Like your job provides benefits, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> like that's where that's where that went. Um, but I, I knew that there were things I needed to do. So I was like, okay, strategically planning, what's next? Um, and so I got a bonus from work and I made sure to prepay some things, you know, paid off a couple of things, like just really took care of things financially as best I could. Uh, because I don't have a 401k and I don't have a huge savings account. And it was like basically I decided that if I was going to be struggling, which I was doing well. But 
paycheck to paycheck more or less, you know? Um, and I was like, you know what, if, if I'm going to have to struggle and if I'm ever going to have to worry about finances, I'm going to do it while I'm doing something I love. Like, this is stupid. Why do I need to hate what I'm doing and struggle? Dumb. So I was like, okay, all the financial things are taken care of as best I can. And then it was like a, about a month before I was leaving. So it was two weeks before I put in my two weeks. I started um, advertising on Facebook, which I kind of have a I have a different take on that than most practitioners do. I don't like what most practitioners do. Um, and then I started putting flyers out anywhere that I was driving past that had like a feed store or a TSC or any kind of tractor store at all. They usually have a bulletin board somewhere. If there was like a, a Western wear or apparel and tack, whatever, I was in there putting flyer up. If I'm willing to drive, if I'm already driving past it, then I'm willing to travel that far in my work, Right. Um, so I did all of that. And then that continued for that whole time through the time that I put my two weeks in, you know, that two weeks, I was still doing all of that. Uh, and when I quit, I, this is where it gets, this is where it gets, nobody would have done this. <laughs> um, when I quit that last day, I went home and then I took the next week and basically told everybody to F off. I'm on vacation. It's a staycation. Don't talk to me. I am not making plans with anybody. I'm taking care of me. It was like this burnout recovery. I'm playing with my pony. I am reading books I want to read. I'm playing video games. I'm watching TV. If you want to take me out to dinner, that can be discussed, but I'm not doing anything for anybody else. Like period. I didn't do dishes. I didn't do laundry. Everybody's on their own. No. Uh, yeah, it was... I know that that's not typical, but I was like, this is what I need. Yeah. And I, and I purposely didn't schedule. I knew like when I was making posts on Facebook, I was saying I'm booking four and it was two weeks after I quit my job. Yeah. Like I wasn't, I wasn't planning. I, it wasn't, on, I it did it intentionally. I, I wasn't planning to see clients in that period. So then the second week after I left my job, I started doing all of the winter prep because this is, um, it was about October. So it was almost this time of year. It was a little bit earlier in October. Um, it was like maybe the first week of October. So it was like all the winter prep, all the fence repair, all the brush cleanup, uh, anything in the house that we were like, we needed to do, like it was project week. Because what I knew was, is that if all of these things were on my mind, then helping horses wasn't. So I refreshed myself and then I cleared my mental load, got all that crap done and out of the way. Smart. And then at that point I had for that first week, my first day of my first week, I had six horses booked and I was like, okay, this is great. Like, this is going to be good. You know, that those six horses and, and the way I do things, I, I do offer a package. So those six horses alone was already over my weekly salary. I was like, done. I only need to work one day this week is fine. <laughs> That's not how that went. <laughs> um, obviously by the time I was done, I had 27 appointments that week and yeah, I made $2,800 in eight days. And I was like, why did I wait so long to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never. You did it though. And that yeah. takes an, an incredible amount of courage and to take that leap of faith, but you have to, because if you don't, what do you live with? Regrets, right? hundred percent. I mean, and that was the thing leading up to that too. Like aside from my job sucks, my soul, like what was I paying? Like, what was I working to get money to pay for this house with the property for the horse that I now have 48 hours tops. And that's if I don't sleep all weekend to hang out with. You know, especially because my commute time only got longer when we moved here. And then, of course, in the summer, when it's a great time to hang out with my horse, because I'm in Michigan, so we have very, very strong seasons. Um, you know, I was commuting an hour and a half both ways. That's three hours in the car. Like, that's three hours of not horse time. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, I it just finally reached that point where I was like, what am I doing this for? Why do I have a job? And I know everybody will be like, to pay your bills. But Why? We say in our program, um, when I was going through my certification, uh, my mentor called it journey of the broke a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, 100%. She, she too is a serial entrepreneur as I myself am. I, I want control over my life, my schedule, 
my day to day, you know, know that I have a choice. I'm not going to, I mean, obviously, right. We make appointments with our clients, of course, you know, we yeah. have to keep them, but it's different. It's different when you feel like you're driving the car, you're yeah. holding the reins, you have the control over this. Well, and when those appointments lead to things that you absolutely adore and like when I make an appointment, I'm going to make an impact. Yeah. Like, I know that that's going to happen when I get there. So like, that's driving factor too. You know, it's, it was very scary. I'm not going to like tell people it's easy and it'll be fun. And like, there are, there were days, there are lots of days where it's like, <laughs> be your own boss. They said, it'll be fun. They said like, no, nobody told me it was going to be fun. I did not come into this delusionally. I knew that there was a chance that I could lose everything, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I was willing to take that chance. Absolutely. And some days are much harder than others, but <laughs> for the most part, I still love the decision. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I, again, can totally relate to that. Oh my goodness. Thank you for that information. A lot of good information for people for sure. Yeah. I will add to that I, when I, cause I do mentor other business owners because I had that amazing result. And then one of my girlfriends was like, I think I'm going to get she has a whole long story. I'm not going to get into it, but she's like, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a massage therapist. She got her certification and I helped her taught her what I did and she did it. And then she booked herself out for four months and had a waiting list. And so she's like, you need to teach other people how to do this. And so like the number one thing that I notice for the people that are like, how am I going to replace my income? And how am I going to, how am I going to, how am I going to, it's, you, a lot of them all think like they need to have at least 40 or 50 horses on the schedule a week. And I'm like, well, that's because you're trying to sell yourself short. You're trying to sell really inexpensive sessions. And that means you need more of them. And that also means you're going to be burnt out and you're not going to have as much to give to each individual horse. So if you just allow yourself to charge what you're worth, then you can see fewer clients, work less hours, have more to give to your clients and create a stronger and better result for every single client. So for anybody out there that's thinking about it, like, please, please, for the love of God, do not go out there charging 40 or $50 to massage a horse. When even in the human industry, it's $90 for an hour. And that human is not going to turn around and bite you or kick you <laughs> if you apply too much pressure. Like it just doesn't make sense. So please, that is like my soapbox for other practitioners. Please, for the love of God, charge a reasonable amount for your service. Don't undercharge yourself or under um, value yourself. Well said. Good advice. How long did it take you to get your certification in equine massage? Well, what is the I, typical? Okay, that's a that's a that's oh. a slippery slope question. Oh, okay, um, there are there are some weekend programs that you can go take where you go for two days. And you get a certification and I'm sure you can assume how I feel about that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm feeling it right through the screen all the way Excellent. from Michigan. <laughs> Excellent. I won't go any further into that. Um, I mean, those courses serve their place. Okay. They serve their place. I, however, do not believe that you're going to go take one of those courses and create the same kind of results that I create. Mm -hmm. That's not a thing. Uh, the program that I took was very in-depth. I remember her saying, this is going to take you at least six months to go through. And I was like, bet, <laughs> watch how fast they do this. Uh, and at the time, of course, I you know, was a mother. My child was in school at that point. Um, so I had some flexibility, but I was still working. I was working and taking the certification and doing all of the family things at the time, right? Um, and I did it. And it was probably really close to six months. Um, but it took a lot of drive. And also my family has a farm full of horses. So it was super easy for me to go out and complete and practice, like complete assignments and practice things. That was easy because I had a whole barn full to choose from. Was this virtual online or do how, how did that work? So there's a variety of options. Um, I took the all online version because I like the school that I wanted to go to, I would have had to drive down to Indiana and I was like, I cannot take a week. I, again, reiterating mother <laughs> working, <laughs> <Enough said. laughs> right? Like can't do that. Um, so I took the online version and I know that there's a lot of, um, 
hesitation when people hear online and they're like, how can you learn massage online? Well, it's really not complicated. We have Zoom, <laughs> you know, um, because to me, the truth, the truth behind that is like, people are concerned about learning feel. I can't teach you feel. You can stand right next to me and I still cannot teach you feel. Right. Because I can't feel what you feel and you can't feel what I feel. So, <laughs> you know, the best I can do is explain it. So I, I did that in about six months. It was uh, a combination of learning anatomy and movement patterns and things like that. And then also the hands-on massage portion. So I now offer a certification program and I have students in there. And my initial thought was six months. <laughs> it's been 10. <laughs> They're close. We're getting there. Um, but it's, it's at your own pace too. You know, like they all have lives. They have full-time jobs. They have families too. So there's no pressure to finish it in, in any amount of time. Um, but I've done a very good job making a very thick course that it's just taking them time to get through the meat. And for me, knowing that people have this, like, how can you teach this virtually? I want to make sure that my students are very confident in the methods. Mm -hmm. And that means, and also in their anatomy, because anatomy is so important when we're, we're doing the kind of work that I do. Cause I don't just do fluffy massage. I do sports massage. I go into every session with an intention of creating an improvement in the way that horse moves, creating an improvement in their way of life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a very drastic improvement. Sometimes it's very subtle, right? So I want to make sure that my students have all the understanding they need. And that means that I throw in really fun, functional, hands-on assignments for them to do and that takes a little bit more time for them to complete, you know, just the logistics of getting someone to videotape for you or setting up your tripod and making sure that it, you know, actually is focused and all those things. And then having the horse there. Not all of my students are horse owners. So that takes a little bit more effort for them to come up with something. Uh, but I added to it because what I went through, uh, there were things that I thought were missing in education. After all of my experience, I'm like, we need to hone in on this. <laughs> so what does that look like, Margaret? Um, okay. I'm, I'm signing up for your certification in equine massage. I'm going to do what, is it a, a, like a Kajabi type of course where you're logging in and then you've got course modules. And then once a week you, you have a, a virtual, you know, with you kind of thing in the whole class. How does that so look? It's actually all hosted on my website, but it is like the same idea as mm -hmm. a Kajabi type thing. So there are modules and lessons within the modules. We, everything is already there. So it's literally just go in and create your own adventure. Where do you want to start? What's the first thing you want to learn? Uh, do you want to go start learning how to assess things so that you can assess what the heck's going on with your horse and get a result right now? Because you can do that. Um, or do you want to start with the anatomy stuff because you don't have your own horse and you want to have a better understanding of how things work. Cause you can do that too. Okay. Um, so we have that option of like, where do you want to start? What's that look like for you? I don't do any regular live trainings. There's the option throughout the entire course to post questions and either I'll answer it directly right there through text, or I'll create another video for you and add it to the module because this is, I want this to operate like a group program where we all kind of get together at the same time and and chat and have a conversation because then we all benefit from each other's questions, but we're all in different time zones and we all have families and jobs and lives. So giving somebody a schedule to stick to is complicated. I wanted this to be as easy as possible for anybody. If you have a ridiculous job and the only time you have to study is at 3 a.m., then do it. Ask your question. And if I, if I can, if I need to, I will create a whole nother video and a whole nother module going deeper into what you want to understand. You know, then once they get through the main certification port part of the program, I actually have a Telegram chat where we can voice message back and forth. I already have preloaded content in there where we go a little bit deeper because this is overwhelming. Like I know for a fact when people come in, they're like, holy crap. I'm like, yes, it's a lot. Um, and that's just the basics, right? But I want people to be able to leave the certification and make a huge impact. I don't want anybody going to an appointment with a client and being like, I don't know what to do. 
So I knew there needed to be more. And so I, I just made that a little bit separate. It's in the Telegram app and it's nice and organized, has topic tabs and you can go in and you can learn a little something extra. Again, ask questions and I'll do a deeper training. But I didn't want to add to what was going on in the main course where there's already like so much going on, right. you know? Um, and beyond that, then it's like, okay, so you get certified. I'm here to mentor you for the rest of your life. Just fucking mesh with me. Like, you got a question? Call and ask. Um, and also I've created a Facebook book, Facebook book, Facebook group uh, for anybody that's been through my programs. So if you've taken the keys to the kingdom, growing your equine therapy business program, you're in there. So that means that if you come through my certification program or the other program, you're all in there together. So it's other practitioners, which is nice with the Keys to the Kingdom program. Then we have practitioners that have been through other trainings and maybe they've never taken a massage certification, but they've done um, assisted, tool assisted myofascial release. And so now you're like, hey, I have this problem with this horse and I've tried all these things and this hasn't worked. And this person over here that's certified in something completely different can say, hey, I think my modality can help, right? So, I mean- I've tried to really create mm. a very well-rounded program, but also still give you outside input where possible. Love Things it. that I don't do either, right? Because I can't do it all. I'd Love like it. to. So can people, like, if I were to, I had an interest in this and I'm like, I want to start tomorrow night, Margaret, can I? Like, is it like you can just, you're not, I'm like, okay, we only start a group every six months. It's the same group. Nobody's gotcha. got time for that. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. And if people are interested, if our viewers and listeners are interested in, in doing this, can we put your information, a link in our description box so that they can click on that and find you? And yeah, absolutely. So there's a link that I have that takes you to everything ever that I've done. Um, so it just, it's almost like a link tree, okay. right? It's got all of that on there. And to sign up for the certification program is literally just go to my website, click learn equine massage. It takes you to a page, click the next button that says get certified now. And as soon as you pay, it's done. You're in, you'll get instant access to everything. Beautiful. I love it. Me too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, here we go. Let's get back to these questions I have for you. You also spoke about intuitive assessment strategies and avoiding short-term solutions for fe for healing your horse or horses in general. What's that all about? And can you explain what that means in practice? Sure. So the certification program is intuitive equine bodywork certification. Okay. Um, that's how I practice, right? It just makes sense. Of course, I'm going to teach how I practice. And so these intuitive assessment strategies are a combination of things that are very logical and trusting your gut instinct, trusting mm. that thought that pops into your head that maybe you can't explain it, <laughs> but this is what you're, this is what the thought is, right? This happens to me all the time. Uh, and it's really, it's really, it's a fun game for me at this point because I'll see a horse and I teach things like hands-on evaluation. So we're going to evaluate the skeletal system for balance and symmetry. We're going to uh, evaluate the muscular system again, balance, symmetry. Uh, and then I do gait analysis. So I want to see the horse move. Okay. And through all of that, right. Again, I want to know everything there is to know but I don't <laughs> and I, I never will, right? There's always more. And I know that this is a problem. I was a new practitioner once. So I know this is a problem amongst new practitioners where we think like, I don't know enough to solve this problem. Uh, I definitely don't have enough knowledge. Like they see something crazy and they're like, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, you don't need to know what to do with it. So we go through these assessments that are very standard, very easy to remember. And then when something occurs to you, that maybe this is the problem. We just accept that and we move forward from there. So that's my intuitive assessment strategy is that when we do these assessments, I'm gonna take note of anything that pops in my head, anything that, think, that I think is significant for whatever reason, or if I'm like, well, I think that looks a little off, but it, I can't really put my finger on exactly why, right? 
I'm going to take that into, into consideration and move forward from that place. So for example, I have a client, I've been working with him for a long time and over, I mean, it's been over a year at this, oh, geez, two years at this point. What? Um, (laughs) uh, Yeah. So in the first year and a half of working with him, we did a lot for him. He's a dressage horse, PRE, imported from Spain and he was okay. He had, he had some, you know, as they're working on moving up out of training level and into first level, he had some stuff going on in his body where he just wasn't moving the way I would want him to be moving, you know, and his trainer is a little bit aware of it, but they're, they're not training him so much as giving the lesson to the rider. And so is it a rider miscommunication or is the horse not able to perform a movement? Right. So you know, the first six months is we're just doing massages and he's making good progress and that's great. And then I noticed a change in how his his pain pattern was presenting in his body. So typically this horse would have a really tight right shoulder. Just he didn't have the same amount of fluidity and movement there and I could just feel a lot of tension in it. Well, all of a sudden we're now going the other way. He's really sensitive through his neck and his left shoulder is just locked up. And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't normal for him. So I ask, you know, what's changed? What's going on here? And she's like, nothing. And I said, does he have something going on in his mouth? When's the last time his teeth have been done? And if he, if he said his teeth done, was it by a veterinarian who just floats teeth or was it by an equine dentist? And she's like, oh, well, actually he's due to have his teeth done next week. The dentist is coming out. And I was like, okay, cool. I think there's something going on there. And she's like, well, actually, he has a history of actually having an issue with his left molars. Uh, But the last dentist that saw him told me it wasn't a big issue. And I was like, I think there's something going on there. So the dentist comes out. Yeah, we need to remove these teeth. There's a major impaction here. And I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say I don't know anything about teeth. I know enough. I know enough to know when we need to get somebody else involved, right? Um, And so, yeah, they pulled his teeth. It took a little bit because we had, they had to get a special surgical dentist, someone that specializes in that issue. So it took a little bit longer, um, but they eventually, so it, for a while there, we were just doing maintenance. And I knew that what's going on in his mouth is what's causing him to really just crunch up here on the left. Um, so we were doing maintenance for a while, finally gets his teeth pulled. One week later, he's moving like he's never moved before. I didn't assess his teeth, but in my mind, I'm like, I think this is a tooth problem. And then she just confirmed it, confirmed it, confirmed it, confirmed it. So again, I don't need to know equine dentistry, but I get to trust my gut, right? Mm -hmm. And so we do go over, there is a connection to the whole entire body through the jaw and the teeth. Every tooth has a connection. So I know that, right? And we do go over a little bit of that in the certification program. The more I learn, the more I share about it. Right. But that's just one example. You know, it's happened in other situations where like that same horse just last month, uh, we've been straightening out his shoulders because I start actually. So six months ago, I was like, what's going on with his feet? What's changed? And his owner's like nothing. And I'm like, well, something's wrong here because we're we're getting imbalance all the way up. So it's got to start at the bottom. (laughs) We're, We're starting at the bottom, working our way up. And she's like, I don't know. There's a new farrier coming out on Friday to look at another horse. I'll have him look at him. Yeah, they revamped his and all of his feet, the whole thing. They changed how he shod the whole nine yards and he started to balance out, but there's still work to be done because how long was he going mm-hmm. around unbalanced, right? So uh, we started kind of evening him out and that didn't take as long, but we were doing more consistent. We did um, a bodywork session. He got his feet done. Two weeks later, we did another one because when you change the angles of the feet, you change everything about how the body moves. That can be really disconcerting uh, and from a neurological standpoint to the body. And then also muscle tension changes and patterns change. So we did a two week session later and he was much better starting to really move in much better again, because his feet were better and it just still wasn't quite right in the sternum area to me. So I was like, I don't know. I just put my hands under there and wait and just kept sliding my hands a, a little bit back every once in a while. When, when I was intuitively prompted to move, I moved 
And so I'm sliding uh, back hits barrel with my hands and we get all the way to the back. And I actually got really scared. I thought he was about to double barrel kick, which was not, this horse is not that kind of horse. So I was like, what's happening? What happened was he literally had a whole wave go through his body of release. I'd never seen it before. It was the coolest thing ever. And of course, I did not have my camera running for that session. <laughs> but I would have never thought to do that. You know, like my education didn't say, put your hands here, move, 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 right? So we trust the assessment intuitively, which was something's not right here. And then we take action on it by just being like, well, what are we going to do? I guess we're just going to put our hands here and see how it goes. Oh, we, it's time to move. Okay, we can move again. And then the release happens. You know, I always explain intuition and this intuitive strategy as our brains are so flipping amazing. And we take in so much information through all of our senses. We cannot possibly comprehend it all consciously. So our subconscious mind puts a filter on it and it's like, this is the important information you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. If It's like if you put on a pair of glasses that record constantly and someone asks you, did you see this today? You'd be like, no, I didn't see that. And then you go back and watch your footage and be like, there it is. It's right there. And I didn't see it mm. because your brain filtered it out, right? So when we're working with intuition, that is a way of our subconscious mind being like, there was something you didn't notice it, but I noticed it, right? So we get to just act on that. And that's where the intuitive part of the strategy, uh, assessment strategies come in is you might not have seen it, seen it, but you saw it. <laughs> Makes perfect sense to someone like me. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. So your background includes multimodalities. I love it. Like equine massage, myofacial release, craniosacral release, K tape, and red light therapy. Can you tell us how all of these techniques complement each other and which cases you find these to be most effective? I use all of those things except for K-Tape in every single session. Unless I okay. forget my red light that day. And if I forgot my red light, then we're just out of luck. <laughs> do you use the 10 light? I do. I do use the 10 light. Um, now, I will be clear. That's just the one that I started with. That was the one that was recommended to me. Yeah, I'm sure so, you have a bigger and better one now. <laughs> no, actually, I don't. I have the same oh. one that I bought originally. It is so durable. I love that it comes with two separate batteries. Yes. Because I can use one and charge one. Yes. <laughs> but I will also say the batteries last forever. It's amazing. Wow. Um, so I use, I, when I do a session, I know there are people out there that piecemeal their offerings. They're like, oh, you want myofascial release? I'll come out and do myofascial release. Oh, you want cranial sacral? I'll come out and do cranial sacral. I don't play that way because I can use myofascial in one area, but still need to come back and do cranial sacral in another. I can use massage technique. Well, first of all, I use massage techniques just to warm the horse up. So it doesn't make sense to be like, I'm just going to come out and do myofascial because I'm going to have to do some massage techniques to warm the horse up before I use myofascial. And basically, when I learned massage, we were taught a variation of trigger point therapy, which is just pressure application in mm -hmm. different levels, soft, medium, heavy pressure application. It works. I'm not going to say it doesn't work. Uh, but after I learned myofascial release, I was like, Seems to me like if I just take out this trigger point bit and add myofascial in, it's kind of same, same. Um, so for the most part, I don't do trigger point the way I used to. Uh, well, also, spoiler alert, I'm in an osteopathic diploma program. <laughs> you can't stop <laughs> me from learning, okay? Um, I love it. Uh, so <laughs> what I learned through there was a lot more about the nervous system and how we are interacting with the nervous system all the time. And to create real change, it's great to, ha to have, it, have it happen in the body, right? But until we change the mind, the pattern in the body remains. Amen. So this is a little bit complicated when we're talking with horses, because I can't say 
my horse's name is Bruce. I can't say, Hey, Bruce, we've released the tension in your bicep femoris on the left. Can you please now adequately use that muscle the way that you were supposed to, right? I want you to really think about it, buddy. I want you to think about how you can track that muscle with every step. You know, with people, we can do that through physical therapy. You know, your physical therapist will actually touch the muscle and be like, all right, contract, contract, contract. Good, good. Whoa, keep contracting, right? Can't do that with a horse. So we have to find ways. This is where my job, like, again, I love the, um, the little bit of mystery and fun and like the puzzles that I get to create. How can I create an exercise that is going to get this horse to start engaging this muscle when their brain no longer sends communication to that muscle because it's taken out of the, the movement loop? It wasn't working for so long. The brain was just like, we can't, we're not even going to waste the energy on trying to get that muscle to work. So send the message somewhere else, right? So we get to come back and address that. Now, myofascial release and cranial sacral therapy are both things that kind of spouted out of osteopathy. So, which is really interesting. It's a whole, that's a whole interesting conversation on its own. Uh, <laughs> so what I learned was when we're using these light touches, we're actually creating with just light touch, a neurological conversation, which doesn't that just make sense? Because I feel this, this is my nervous system responding to a touch on my face. Like the message is there. So when I apply the lightest pressure, the horse's nervous system is already responding. It's already aware of what's going on in that location, right? Now I'm not gonna say that everything I do is super light and non-invasive because that's not true. There are times where bigger movements are necessary and a little bit more pressure works really well. But I like to have my toolbox full, so to speak. And be able to just interact with mm. the body, have a two-way conversation. So all of those things go together just in what comes to mind. What do I need? What's gonna, what part of my toolbox is gonna be the best for this situation? And the only reason that KT isn't a part of every session is because it doesn't need to be. Mm. And it can be kind of a hassle. It doesn't have to be a hassle, but if I've got clients that were like, well, the K tape would serve really well if we put it across their back, but you want to ride tomorrow and you're going to go 10 miles, it's probably not going to be comfortable to have it under the saddle. So applying it now doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right. That's, I reserve the K tape for more situations where I'm like, we need to have a nervous system conversation that lasts 24 plus hours. And your horse is not in a state to be doing anything anyway. Hmm. Right. Because if we can create exercises, if I can say, hey, go do this pull work exercise just for 10 minutes tomorrow, that's going to help get that horse to start waking that muscle up again. Because the work that I did is starting to wake the muscle up with that connection to the brain. So now I want you to go out tomorrow and do this exercise to really encourage that to keep going. I don't need the tape. It serves definitely in some situations, but we don't need it all the time. It can be costly. It doesn't always stay. When we're talking winter in Michigan, forget it. It's not going to stay on winter hair. Then you get to spring in Michigan and the hair is falling off. So then it's not going to stick. And then we get this small winter window of summer where it's like, oh, it's going to stick. And then they start shedding for fall. Like <laughs> it just, it's not a very, I mean, we can do a lot with it on the legs for sure. I use it more on legs than anything, but still don't use it a lot there either. Oh my goodness, girl. I, I just listening to you, I, I envision you showing up, right? To work on my horse, Dakota, and you literally have a toolbox of some of the finest tools possible. And I love that you intuitively and, you know, expertly know which it tool to use and when to use it and can combine all of the above as needed when needed that oh my gosh why don't you live closer to me <laughs> <laughs> well you know um I you're in Connecticut right like your weather isn't better than mine so I'm not moving out there I'm sorry <laughs> Uh, but I do offer a lot of stuff online. You I know, know. that was I'm, a thing. I'm, that was a thing. You know, when I started, I was like, I saw that hole where people, I would see people on Facebook groups all the time. Like, I don't have a therapist near me or my horse is already getting massage. And I'm like, okay, but this hasn't changed. Well, the massage therapist didn't say anything about it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I do offer 
Like in my Facebook group, for example, you have a problem with your horse that hasn't been able to be solved. You can jump into my Facebook group, post five photographs. I tell you exactly which ones to post. You can post five photographs. I'm going to come in. I'm going to mark that up. I'm going to look at your horse's posture. I'm going to identify where the problems are. And then I'm going to say, here's a 20 minute call. Let's talk. Then I'm going to give you something you can go do to make this better. Excellent. So there will be a link for that. Yeah. For, yep. For that's totally viewers. on my link page for sure. Yep. Excellent. 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 Everything that you've, you've spoken of, I have an equine sports, uh, PEMF therapist that comes out to, to work with Dakota used to take care of all my horses once a month, along with chiropractor, massage therapist. But she, you know, she mentioned the same things as you, she's like, you know, massage therapist, equine massage therapist, but these are the critical things. And they were everything that you mentioned. She's like, if they're not if they're not well versed in that, nah, you know, so. yeah, and it's tricky. You know, I um, I have a podcast as well, and on my podcast, I did a whole episode about picking your practitioner. Who are you going to call? Why would you pick them? And also one about regulations, because there are no regulations in the massage industry on a national level, and there's only one state in the country of the United States. Okay, let's not get out into the world. If you're in a different country, do your research. Um, there's only one state and it's Washington state that actually requires a licensing for animal massage. I did not know that. Yeah. So the other, there, there are other states like, for example, New York, where you cannot practice without the supervision of a veterinarian. There are other states like that too. Check with your veterinary board um, to see what your requirements are. Uh, for the most part, I think New York is pretty much the strictest, but for the most part, a lot of practitioners just work with veterinarians and they say, hey, this is what I do. They create a relationship with the veterinarian and then the veterinarian kind of just signs off on that they're not going to do anything stupid and hurt your horse, right? Um, but it is, it is harder to practice in a state like New York where you have to have actual supervision. Uh, but that's the thing, you know, there's no regulation nationwide and I'm okay with that. To an extent, I don't think the government coming in and putting a regulation on it is going to solve any problems. <laughs> um, the human massage industry is highly regulated and they still have the same issues. There's mm -hmm. a, a, a place in my town that is actually, it's for humans, a, mas a massage and rehab facility, literally in the name, massage and rehab. And so my mom was having a problem with her neck and I said, hey, why don't you go check out the massage and rehab place up there? I'm sure that they're going to help you out and give you some exercises, tell you what went wrong, all the things. She mentioned the problem with her neck. They gave her a fluffy massage. She left. She had no guidance. Her neck still didn't feel great. I'm like, clearly regulations aren't the answer, <laughs> you know? Um, so I just try and teach my students from a place of integrity and encourage them to always be in integrity so that if you don't know the answer to a question, say that you don't know the answer and also go find the answer. Mm. Talk to who you need to talk to because that's how we serve people. Right. Uh, and I think that that's the thing too. This, again, I'm coming back kind of to, I don't agree with a lot of the social media that other practitioners put out there to get clients because it's a lot of regurgitating of anatomy. And did you know this? And did you know that? And that's great. We should educate people. But when you're regurgitating what everybody in the industry should know at a base level, that's not serving anyone. Like we should all know anatomy and muscle function and you're not setting yourself apart from everybody else. So how are you serving your clients from that space? We want to always be looking at how we can better serve because it's always about the horse. If we're not getting results for the horse, AKA the horse's owner, then what are we even doing? You know, there has to be a line where it's like, I can't serve you anymore. I've tried and I'm not getting anywhere, but you know what? I know this other practitioner and she practices different than I do. She might be a better fit. Sure. You know, people, people are afraid to do that kind of thing, but that's like when mm -hmm. someone asks you a question and you've hit a wall where you're like, I don't know. And what I'm doing isn't working. We get to be of enough integrity to say, let me help you find the answer. I love it. Because that's that's what it's all about. It's all about the horse. The horse is who suffers when we don't do that. 
Absolutely. I know that as, as a Gestalt practitioner, right? I'm working with humans, a lot of trauma and healing work, but I'm going to and have encountered a client that it's, it's outside of my, you know, realm of awareness of, of, of experience. And so absolutely, uh, there's no room for pride here. When your focus is for me, it's about my client getting the best help they possibly can and getting answers. So it's like, guess what? Oh gosh, I just did it two weeks ago and I'm thrilled with the outcome so far. The well, you learned, the connection. you learned something from that experience too. You know, so you, you're better able to help the next situation that comes along that is similar to that because, like you said, originally it was out of your realm of, well, realm, good Lord, realm of awareness, but now it's in your realm of awareness. Right. And you still might not be the best person to solve the problem, but you can at least give your client a little bit more reassurance and say, hey, I've had this happen before. It's okay. You're not weird. You're not broken. You're not, you know, this is not an uncommon circumstance. It's okay. I know what to do. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's one of the most powerful things. Like, listen, I tell people all the time, I did not become a horse massage therapist because I like hanging out with people. <laughs> uh, but I have found that I actually thoroughly enjoy being able to offer that solace and that peace of mind to the owner. Yeah. I mean, there are so many people that I meet with that are just like, I don't know, should I change their diet? Should I do this? Is this leg broken or is it not broken? Like, can we fix this? Do I just need to put them down? Do I need to get a different farrier? Like, what do I need to do? And it's just like, breathe, run me through everything you know. So like when I get a new in-person client, I get, I send them a very ridiculously thorough intake form. I want to know what they eat. I want to know how they live. I want to know the last time they saw the vet, what the vet said, what the problem was. I don't know the last time they saw the chiropractor, all the things that the chiropractor said. I want to know all of those things because there's going to come a time, like, especially my new clients, they're calling me because they've heard of me and they're like, you're my last stop. What do I do? So I want to know all that information so that I can come into them and say, deep breaths. This is what I noticed. You know, and we have this conversation after I've done my intuitive assessments. This is what I've noticed. And if it were my horse, this is how I would move forward. Also, you didn't do anything wrong. You did the best that you could. And we're still moving forward. Because I've been that horse owner too. You're just frazzled. And you're heartbroken because you feel like you're not doing what you what you should be doing. That somehow you're failing your horse. Nobody wants to be in that position. Yeah. And so admittedly, I actually like working with people too. <laughs> <laughs> now everyone knows. Uh, crap. <laughs> but don't, no, nobody get any mis misconceptions here. I am not ever going to take a human massage course. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now that I've said that, I'm probably have to come back to you in like 15 years and be like, darn it. I took the course. <laughs> <laughs> probably. And I I'll said like never. I'm not surprised. You I just know. ran out of things to take, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So yeah. a lot of our listeners are really busy horse owners, right? We're <laughs> For a lot of us, we're trying to work and do this and do that and take care of our, our horses. And we're caretakers for other people too. And you did mention... <laughs> You're like, how, how did I mention all these things <laughs> that they, they might not have time to read textbooks or do extensive research? So how do you help those individuals incorporate simple, practical solutions into their horse care routines? Well, um, I talk a lot, if you haven't noticed through this whole experience. Um, I love it. <laughs> so I have a podcast and sometimes I feel like I get off track over there, but then I have people reach out to me and tell me it was exactly what they needed to hear. So we're just going to let that flow. Like I run my mouth over there. Um, it is the same name as my Facebook group. So hope for the hopeless horse. And also my Facebook group, that is a huge one. And people don't usually dig through that and 
to their own loss because I have many courses in there uh, about saddle fit, about what is posture versus what is confirmation, about using the emotion code and muscle testing for your horses. So a little bit of that energy work. Uh, there's just an oodle of information in that Facebook group. But if I had to say one thing to help someone specifically who is short on time and they have a problem, join my Facebook group, post the five pictures of your horse, and then join me for a 20 minute conversation. All in, you might be, you know, if you have to struggle to get your horse to stand still for the pictures, it might take you a total of 45 minutes of taking pictures and sitting down and talking to me for 20 minutes. Because if you come to me and you're very specific about what your needs are, I can say, go this way, go that way, and then maybe turn around and do this with your horse. Right? Nice. nice. I mean, again, I, I am that busy person too. It's just that I've dedicated my life to learning all of this. So I have no problem giving free 20 minute calls to help people get in the right direction. I love it. Wow. Earlier in your journey, you believed that some horses couldn't meet your ambitions due to physical or behavioral limitations. How did learning more about rehabilitation and healing change your perspective on this? Well, this might make me cry. Oh, <laughs> I'll um, cry with you, Margaret. <laughs> so the thing is, is like, there was the experience that I had as a kid, right? Which was in Pony Club. I rode and rode and rode and rode. <laughs> I rode a variety mm -hmm. of different horses, but we weren't rich growing up. So my mom got what was free or really cheap. And that made me a really good rider. Uh, and not always in a fun way, <laughs> right? <laughs> I can have a really well-developed seat because I've ridden my fair share of bucking Broncos. Um, but when I look back at pictures, I see things now. <laughs> You know, I, I see things now that I could not, like, I, I don't feel bad about it because I could not have possibly known. Mm -hmm. And if anything that bothers me about that time is that the adults around me also didn't know and didn't pursue the knowledge. Again, not really their fault either, but like, if I had to be more upset with anybody, it was like, who was, who was teaching? Yeah. Right. That, like that level of responsibility as an educator, I carry that level of responsibility. Um, so again, that comes back to integrity of being able to say, time out, I learned something new. <laughs> we need to change how we do this. Um, or, you know, this was brought to my attention and we should really deep dive into it. So I have a couple examples of this. One was a pony. She was a big pony, she quarter pony. She was like 14 one. So she was pretty big pony, but she was just nasty. Like, I mean, she was okay when you were on the ground and she would take treats from you and she would walk okay on the lead line, but you had to fight her for everything as soon as you got on. And if she could avoid getting caught, that would be ideal in her world. And when I look at pictures now, I'm like, oh my gosh, first of all, the saddle on that horse, what were we thinking? Like, it doesn't fit. It's too far forward. And, you know, I grew up in Pony Club. We talk about saddle fit. They teach saddle fit. And I'm like, who let me out of the barn with this? You know, uh, this is insane. And then the other thing I noticed in the pictures is that she, along her cervical vertebrae, so the cervical vertebrae run the bottom of the neck, she had little lumps and dimples along there. And what I know now is her cervical vertebrae weren't even in alignment. Like girl needed a chiropractic adjustment. Like I have never needed one that bad in my life. No wonder, no wonder she was always going around with her head in the air. No wonder she was stiff. No wonder she didn't want to participate. No wonder all of the no wonders between the bad saddle fit and the way her neck felt. She had every right to be as cranky and as miserable as she was. I don't you think now I grew up the same way as you did. My my father had a big riding stable as a child. You know, I started riding at three and four. Um, 
but they were different back then. Now I'm talking, I'm a lot older than you, right? I'm in my sixties. So we're talking, you know, this is the the seventies, early seventies. And they were just different. Like they didn't have the same kind of awareness about horses. Like you almost like, Oh, your horse, you, we didn't look for pain. If a horse bucked or reared, you punished it, right? You, you rode it harder. Yes. And yes. It, oh my gosh. This I is choose. still a mentality. It's still a mentality. Still, and it's, yeah, that's still there. In, but we, and but there are more people that are becoming 100%. aware. Are aware There's more awareness. That. And it, it does make it difficult for me to talk about it as much as I feel like it should. Because then I, I mm. every time I turn around, I see other people that are aware. So I think that we can slow down that conversation. But then I see a post that says something like, um, I need to bring my horse back and I haven't ridden him in a year. And I went out and we rode for three hours yesterday and got the saddle blanket wet, but now they're lame and I don't know why. And I'm like, yeah, well, right. Where do I begin? <laughs> right. Yeah. So I know the conversation still needs to be there, but absolutely, you know, and especially when we're talking about in the sixties, seventies, even in the eighties and coming into the nineties, yeah, we're still transitioning out of that cowboy from the old West. Oh, sure. You right? know, we and broke I think horses, remember, we broke horses. We didn't start them. We broke them. Absolutely. What? And I absolutely. was that person way back. I was. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, even now looking back at that, there's a piece that we missed coming out of that old cowboy mentality. Yes, they broke horses and that wasn't ideal, but there was also an extremely high level of care with a cowboy. I find that when I talk to people that truly worked with, lived with, or lived the lifestyle of being a cowboy, there was something that didn't translate from their lifestyle into the common show world or the more recreational version of being a cowboy, even at the rodeo level, because they relied on that horse day in and day out. And some days they were out camping, okay, for days at a time. They had to, they were very aware when their horse wasn't right. And they didn't just assume that because their horse wasn't chasing cattle accurately, that they were just being an a-hole because they had a closer level relationship. Right. It was a real relationship there. <laughs> and that's the difference, Versus right? showing up at the barn to hop on your horse. Yeah. And I think that that, that didn't translate because I even think that the cowboys that broke horses back then also broke them to a relationship to some extent, not all of them, That's but to true. some extent, because the ones that raised their own horses on their own ranch broke their own horses and then worked their own horses. Right. right? right. That was a continuous relationship from, to start to finish. We don't have that. Right. We don't, we don't see that. I mean, unless you're still working out the cattle out in Montana or whatever, we're not seeing that, right. you know, so there we get, mm. I don't ascribe to that cowboy mentality, but then I also have to put the asterisks on it and be like, it's a false cowboy mentality. It's sure. the people that think that they're cowboy, but they're not way there, right. you know, but really, yes, it's all about awareness. And if we want to take this to the bigger picture, uh, and for those of you who are into the energy and the woo, if you will, the consciousness of the planet, everything on the planet is rising. We're becoming more aware on a broader level. So it just makes sense that the horse industry is following. You know, um, we just, uh, we, it's not, it's not everybody on the planet is following the same ascension path at the exact same speed, right? Um, so we get to be a little bit gracious and help ed educate people about what they're missing, really. Mm -hmm. You know, because when I look back, so the other story, uh, of like how we kind of, how this has impacted me was looking back at a horse that I absolutely love to death. Uh, his name was Shai Wei Wan. He was the Michigan trotting champion in his two-year-old year, which was also the year I was born, 1987. <laughs> um, and he was amazing. Like he had an amazing career. I was 12. He was 14. They have to retire at that age automatically. And my mom was working with these horses and the owner of Juan at the time was like, he deserves a good retirement. And he said, here, Jenny, which is my mom. She's like, 
here, you take him for your daughter. I know he'll have a good home with you. I know you guys will take care of him and see what he can do next. Cause 14 is not old really, you know, but he had had 12 years of solid career, you know, well, a little bit more than that. Cause they break them, uh, <laughs> at about a year old, you know, and they get some time before they start racing. But anyway, a uh, year and a half old, they break. So when I got him, I was jumping. I'm doing cross country. I'm doing a little bit of dressage. I love show jumping, but I'm 12 and I'm jumping about two foot six and he can manage it. But the, you know, it's probably a year into really solid working with him. He started to knock poles. He started to rush fences. It just became more and more apparent to me that he was uncomfortable. And I can say that because as a 12 year old, I didn't just want to win a competition. I still had that little girl dream in the back of my mind where the pony greets you at your bedroom window every morning and you just swing it open and they're just like standing there and telepathically, <laughs> you know, that they just want to go out and take you for a picnic and you're going to ride bareback and you're just going to wear your nightgown and your little ballet slipper shoes. And you're just going to go outside. You're just going to jump on the bareback and they're going to run you off through the woods and you're going to stop and they will have laid out a blanket with some cookies and whatnot right next to a stream where all the animals just kind of hang out around you guys. Right. I can <laughs> just see it. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> um, you know, that that was still something I wanted more than anything was to have the relationship. That magic of connection was still so deeply ingrained in my heart at that age. And that horse gave it to me. He would follow me everywhere. He would do anything I asked, even when things got hard for him. Mm -hmm. Oh, so at that point, I thought I was doing the best thing I could do for him. And I retired him. I said, you were a champion in one career. And then we got honored with being so skilled in his next career. We were invited to the Michigan Horse Expo to showcase what he was doing, showcase who he had become after having such a great career as a racehorse. You know, here we are at the expo showing him jumping and being a dressage horse and just his heart and his versatility, or versatility, you know? So it was amazing. But not long after that, I was like, it's it's time. You've done so well. You have said, I couldn't have asked for better. What and a when beautiful I, way to honor him. It seemed like it. He didn't agree, uh, which is really just what crushed my heart even more and why I get even more emotional about it because... I retired him. So he came home and he sat in the pasture and I got another horse because I'm not done. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting started. Two foot six, that's nothing. Like I was ready for three foot and up, but I couldn't ask my horse that had already given so much of himself to keep going at that point. So I got another horse and Juan stopped eating. And he started standing in the run-in shed, which was really not a run-in shed, but it was part of the barn. It was covered, his hit the covered space that they had. And he would just stand in there by himself with his head in the corner. Mm. And I would try and engage with him. And he it was like he was not there for me anymore because I left him. Mm. So, I mean, besides being extremely upset as a kid who was like, I love you. And I thought I was doing the best thing for you. You know, my mom was like, I think it's best if we send him. We had some friends that lived in upper Michigan. All they did was trail ride. She's like, I think it's best if we send him up there. He can be a friend to their horse. They can then go on trail rides. Like that would be the best retirement for him. And he did. He got up there. He adjusted. He was being used again. Um, I never saw him again, though you know, just the nature of it. Um, I don't know that he ever came back to himself, you know, completely. But when I look back now and I look at those pictures of him and I jumping, I can see all the things that I could have done that would have made him able to continue, mm -hmm. that he didn't have to be done there. Yeah. That didn't have to be his end and we didn't have to part ways. Mm -hmm. And so that really fuels me forward in what I do because I 
I mean, I was heartbroken. And again, like I'm more of a horse person than I am a people person. So I don't ever want another horse to be that heartbroken. Yeah. But then I can also completely and totally empathize and put myself in the shoes of the horse owner who's like, I still have goals and dreams. And in some cases, this is their career. Mm. They have to get another horse, you right. know, you yeah. know, and, and it's not even, I mean, it's not have to like, my life depends on it. It's my soul depends on it. Because so many of us horse people, we are not the same people when we don't have horses in our lives. So, and then, yeah, right. And then to be that kind of horse person and to be heartbroken because your best friend can't fill the role, then you have to get a replacement. That sucks. And then you're going to have relationship problems with that next horse because that's not where your heart's at. Right. There's so um, many problems that we can undo by just addressing their body. Yeah. And you know, it's I my gelding who has come back to me four times in my life. And now he's with me for right to the end. Oh, he is God. my best friend. He is, I know that he and I shared a past life together, as crazy as it sounds. Not We're crazy. Very aware of it. In fact, you'd laugh and you'll get this yesterday coming down the driveway to the barn and he's got a huge turnout, right? And he's out grazing and he sees my car pull up and here he comes galloping across the pasture. And then I get out of the car and he's dancing like he's bucking and rearing and spinning around in a little circle and bucking and rearing and spinning around. And my heart is ready to explode out of my chest watching him do a happy dance I could feel Aww. his excitement and I had just been there the night before it wasn't like I, nobody was there or he hadn't had his breakfast and his lunch and he's out with I, was, I knew that dance was for me yeah but he did have an injury a while back suspensory desmitis um being foolish he likes to pretend he's like two and do, you know he can play like he used to but um we ultrasounded him. We saw where it was. We, you know, we came up with a game plan for him. But, um, you know, I, that was the time when I looked at my vet and I said, I don't care what we have to do. And I don't care if I never, ever get on his back again. Yep. We do what we have to do. And he's in my life, whether we retire him right now or not, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. This horse can never leave me again. Yep. I I, will, totally I don't think it. I could recover. And yeah. so I totally, totally get that. You know, I do. Do I love to ride? Yes. But do I have to? No, what's really most important to me is the time I spend. I even bought a hammock to put across his run-in shelter nice. that's in the corner of his pasture so that we can, we love to nap together. That horse will lay right down. I love that. You, oh my gosh. You, you just can't that once that connection is there, it's, Oh God. I totally agree. I mean, I, so I meditate with my horses every morning. <laughs> uh, I, I have a mounting block out there, but I also have some of those folding chairs, like those camping chairs that I'll just yes. sit down in. And I mean, if I'm really desperate, I'll sit on the ground. I don't care, <laughs> yes. you know, just to have that time yes. with them. hundred percent. Yes. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I'm all the time. I've got a coffee, whatever. And I'm just sitting, just sitting. And when I had four horses, it was the same thing. It was like even meals. Mm -hmm. My ex-partner and I would go out with the plate of food and just sit out while yeah. the horses were grazing and they, you know, have to come in and what are you eating? Can I have some, whatever, but is there a carrot on that plate? <laughs> yes. It's just such a beautiful yeah. And, you know, there's people out there that have. have trouble getting having time. Like they tell me, I don't have time to spend with my horse. I'm like, do you not have time to spend with them or do you not have time to ride and work them? Right. Because there's a very drastic difference. You can go spend five minutes in the barn and feel so much better when you leave. Even if you only have five minutes, like it is worth every second. Every Under second. Hundred percent. I end up spending hours. You probably do too. I can't help it. It's just like that's my yeah. great. I can start like 
get home from work, get in the car and like have this little bit of anxiety and I'll do my practice breathing, you know, to get myself regulated and be in the right frame of mind. Cause I don't like to get out of my car unless I'm completely regulated. Um, but I feel like I went on some beautiful meditative journey just after brushing him, sitting yeah. with him, sweeping the barn aisle, you know, getting all his meals prep, playing with his ears. And, and he's a very, <laughs> he's a very lovable horse. Like he's always all up in your business and got to taste everything. And I do, I get in my car when I leave and I'm like, God, I feel so much better now. Oh, I needed that drug. Dakota's my drug. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a thing, you know, there's a, that's, that's their energetics, right? Like I was talking about kind of in the beginning of my story was they are grounding. They have the largest part energetic field of mammals on the planet. Absolutely. So, you know, they literally do help you regulate. Uh, and I love that about them. I always just try and get my clients to do what you do, where it's like, we're going to regulate before we get there. Because one of the things that I found working with so many horses is that they feel used. They, and not that they're like, oh, I feel used. They're like, what do you want from me? They have this expectation of we want something and they don't know how to just receive. If we just send them love, they're like, what is that? What do I have to do to earn it? Right. And I think so many people can relate to that feeling of what do I have to do to earn love today? What do I have to do to earn anything today? My paycheck, respect, you know, good relationships. What do I have to do to earn it? And our horses are doing the same thing. So when we can do what you're talking about, regulate before we come into their contact so that every time we show up, we're not taking. Right. Because even if you show up just to sit, but you brought all your emotional garbage with you. There is a time and a place. I'm not suggesting that we should not use our horses to wipe our tears. That is not it. There's a time and a place for it. But when you do it consistently over and over and over, they're going to keep doing that for you because they love you and they want to please. But just like in any relationship, just because you have a best friend that's always trauma dumping on you doesn't mean that you love it. Doesn't mean that you, you know, aren't feeling resentful six months later when you're like, girl, you haven't asked me how I felt for six months. Your horse does the same thing. Valid point. Great point. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's why my Dakota does a happy dance when he speaks to me. Because he's just like, oh, it's going to be fun. wonder what mom got up for sleep today. Oh, gosh, she probably brought me an apple. Well, I guess yeah. she's going to comb out my tail and my mane. Oh, man. Sure. Just... Like they enjoy all of those things that we do for them. But also remember, like you love showing up and being in Dakota's energy. Other horses are great, but Dakota's energy <laughs> is your jam. He feels the same way about your energy. Yeah. These yeah. really. And that's I think that's the thing is like we often look at our relationships with our horses as being. I mean, I don't think we do it intentionally. I don't think that we have a conscious process that does this, but we end up acting out that it is very one-sided. We show up and we to go for a ride because this is what we're doing today. We show up and we decide that this is, you know, we're going to go walk this trail. We show up and we decide we're only going to brush you today. We show up and we decide you can eat today. Right. When really what we all want, what that little girl dream was always about was reciprocation and the horse choosing it. Absolutely. That horse waiting at that little girl's window in the morning to take her on a picnic was his choice. There was no halter on him. There was no lead rope. There was no groom telling him this is where you need to stand. Yeah. That horse chose you. And I, I want people to know that. Your ho horse chose you. It's like Harry Potter and the wands, right? They go to Ollivander's. The wand chooses the wizard. The horse chooses the rider just as much as the rider chooses the horse. <laughs> he Yes. And boy, did he, all of my horses did. And boy, did he. I mean, I saw his picture and had to go meet him. And my partner at the time was like, are you thinking about buying another horse? And I was like, no, 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 no. But there's something about him. And then I met him. And that bond, it was so strong like my heart went boom and I was like oh crap I'm, I'm gonna do it 
I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> Who do I make the checkout to? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, okay, oh, I did it again. Oh, he said, and that's the that moment. I'm like, it's, it's not like it's, you know, they're potato chips or anything. We kind of <laughs> are. But but when you get that bond, you just. It's different. I, I can't not listen to it. I just, there's this right. little pony, Shetland pony at the barn where he is. And that pony, I swear, that's another one. I'm like, ooh, Toby, I've known you somewhere else. <laughs> and he, he's like, yeah, that's right. And I wasn't just this little turd that I am now. <laughs> he's like, I was a big war horse once. I can't believe they stuck me in this little body because his, and he's like the little Napoleon. I'm like, ah, look at you. He, he is bigger than life, bigger than life. And he knows it. He and plays he's like with the big horses. He's like, wait till the next incar incarnation and I will show you how big I am. Hopefully. <laughs> he's like, I'm really confused. I don't know why they did this to me. Oh, I must have been an asshole. <laughs> he, he has something to learn about having a big energy in a small body. <laughs> yes, I think so. I believe that. It's like when I find a spider in my house and I can't kill it, I pick it up because I look at it and I go, hmm, what did you do in your past life where you harmed another human being or, you know, oh. scared them? And yeah. right now you're terrified that I could step on you, but I'm not I don't going to. I don't send the same message to spiders. I'm usually running and screaming in the other direction. So they're terrifying me now. Um, but I do, I don't generally murder them. Um, I name them all Frank. I don't know if they're male or female, but I'm like, all right, listen, Frank, you got to stay over there and I'm going to stay over here. And as long as you stay over there and I stay over here, we're going to be fine. We're good. Can I tell you, okay, speaking of spiders, about a snake, a very large snake that was would curl up outside of one of my outbuildings on my farm. And I'd be mowing or whack, weed whacking. And I, I the first few times I encountered it, it's like I was like, yeah, because I didn't see it. And then it would, and it was massive, right? So then I felt bad. So I knew she, I call her she, I don't know if it was a she, but I knew it was always even going know? to be there. You don't. And I'm not picking it up because it, I don't think it would let me do. Might have. But after a while, I would speak to it as I approach. And then it would it started to slither off slow. Well, after a while, it would not slither off. I would approach it and she would pick her head up and just look at me and I'd say, Hi. I see you're sunning today. I'm going to mow the lawn or I'm going to do, I just don't want you to be afraid. And she'd go and then right back to sleep. It was crazy. I'm like, oh my God, I think I just like tamed a snake and I don't, <laughs> it was, it was weird, but like we had that same energy yeah. exchange and she was 100%. like, you're gentle. I know you won't harm me. You could have many times and you didn't. And so I, I'm going to stay here. Yeah. So yeah. you've, you've said, or ex given the example of a few things that I talk about a lot on my podcast and with my clients, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving into the energy era where this is what I'm talking about because everybody needs to know this. <laughs> and that is like, you can create that connection to anything if you just set the intention to do it. Right. And so one of the things that I do and have done, I continue to do is talk to my horses like you talk to that snake. So one time I have three horses right now. Um, last year I brought home a retired standard bread that of course I worked with. This is a whole nother story. And I don't think that we can get into it right now, but um, I brought him home from a kill pen, how we found him in the kill pen and all that. That's a whole thing. Lots of alignment and magic in it. Um, but for the purpose of this story, I brought him home last year and I had already two horses, my retired standard horse, standard bred Bruce. <laughs> and again, magical story and getting him back because I also worked with him in his career. Um, and then I had purchased last year, a Frisian quarter horse cross that someone said was broken and done. And I was like, watch me fix this. And I did. So now I have these three horses. Last year um, in mid-November, we had had lightning home. We, we brought him home 
the first weekend in November. So he'd been home for a couple weeks and I had them split up. So Bruce and Cash, the quarter horse, the Frisian quarter horse, were on one side of the fence and Lightning is on the other because Lightning was in a kill pen. He needs a lot more food and time to eat it. And mm -hmm. the other two are, I, I have two beefcakes and a pancake. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bruce and Cash are beefcakes. They are big boys. And Lightning is a pancake and he still needs more fluff. Um, <laughs> so I had them separated and Bruce is, Bruce is my main man. Okay. Bruce and I also have had experiences, past lives, the whole nine, uh, and a connection in this life 10 or plus more years ago when he first started racing. Uh, I was the groom that started him and managed his care. So we have this connection that spans years. And I love that I got him back. And he's he knows he's my main man. We've done so much at Liberty, like I broke him to ride at Liberty. I broke him to the saddle and all the things like he didn't care. He was like, I'm down to learn all these things. You don't need a halter with me. You don't need a lead rope. I'm like, this is magic. So we have that relationship. And then in July, I brought cash home and Bruce was like, cool, I have a buddy. And then I brought the third horse home who needs more attention, more care, more food, and takes more of my time at the end of October, beginning of November. Needless to say, we had that horse for two weeks and Bruce finally threw a tantrum. He is so gentle and so good about everything. Listen, this horse will not cross a fence line where the fence does not exist anymore. There are parts of my property where we moved a fence line back and he's like, mm, I need an escort. This, there's a, this is a borderline. I need an escort. Human, escort me across this line. Okay. He doesn't test fences. He doesn't push that. He's very chill and just grounded in himself, very confident in himself. He's just, he knows he's the head honcho and that's fine. Until I've now brought two horses home in just a few months. And he's like, this horse is taking all my mother's attention and it's bullshit. He came running into the barn and I have two stalls that are basically free in and out. We call them condos. <laughs> so they have access to go out into the pasture, come in anytime they want. He comes tearing into his stall, turns and kicks the whole wall down. Just takes all the boards are flying. And I'm just like, what is even happening? If I wasn't in there when that was happening, I would have never believed that he did it. I would have blamed Cash 100%. I've never seen anything from Cash like that either, but I would have blamed him because <laughs> there's no way it was Bruce. Um and he just, he started a meltdown. He took his terror, his terror rain outside and started threatening lightning through the fence, not crossing it, but lightning's trying to have his dinner. And Bruce is just pinning his ears and kicking at him. And like, he, it's, it's like, you could hear him screaming go at away. lightning. Yeah. Like go back to wherever you came from. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, this can't happen. I now have to fix this wall before we have a loose horse. And you're just reign of terror. So I, I had to get a whip to funnel him just to, you know, direction, extend my arms to funnel him out to the pasture so I could shut the gate so that he could be in time out on your own, sit out there and think about what you've done. Right. I come in, I fix the wall and then I take hay out and I go and I sit with him in time out. And I literally sat down and had a conversation with him about how his behavior was inappropriate. And that he is my favorite and he is always going to be my favorite. Don't tell the others, but you're my favorite. And I mean that. I love you more than anything. You're never going to leave here. You are always going to be here. You are always going to be mine. I'm never going to choose anyone over you. But both of those horses deserve to live. And that is why they're here. I have not had one problem with him since that day. I'm not surprised. I'm and the pasture does not have a dividing fence anymore. Lightning is in with Bruce and Cash, and he gets to eat his own food separate from every separate from everybody else. Nobody tests the boundary. They Bruce just, just needed to hear you say to reassure him because he's probably thinking, "Is this my replacement? Is yep. it? As does mom not love me anymore?" You know, we think they don't understand, but let me share with you something since you've shared that beautiful story and amazing. And I 
totally get it with me. My dog here, right? We we moved from 1,800 square feet into 400 square feet. So we went from a king size bed to a twin bed, and she had always slept with her mama. Uh -huh. So when we moved in here, we were still sleeping together. And mom was not sleeping at all. Yeah. Okay. Because right. I move around a lot and I didn't want to disturb her. So I really, it was awful. And I was messing up appointments and stuff because I was lacking sleep. And I was on a Zoom call with a student that I was coaching. And I mentioned in front of Dami, I'm like, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm like, I'm not sleeping. I'm going to have to not let my dog sleep with me anymore. And I hate that, but I, we can't share a twin size bed. She's going to have to sleep on the sofa. She never asked to be in my bed again from that oh. night forward. And I did not get in bed and have to say no, or you can't. It's crazy. There are nights too when I'll say to her, are you going to eat your breakfast? You didn't eat your breakfast. And she'll hop off the sofa and jump out, run over and eat her, which is now dinner, like things like that. And I'm like, this is uh, what? It's possible, right? And like that's why I say I'm in the, I'm in my energy era because people need to understand that this is possible. So the other thing that you did was you had, when we were talking about something, you were commentating for the little pony for Toby, right? So he said, yep. yeah, yep. you're commentating for him. And I did that as a kid all the time in front of people. It's like, I couldn't, I didn't have, nothing would stop it. It would just flow out of my mouth. Right. And yep. everybody would laugh and it was so funny, but it wasn't real. Right. That wasn't actually yeah, was. what the animal was thinking because that's crazy. Yeah, it was. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. You know, so, and then, so, and, you know, that was probably when I was 12, I stopped doing that. Right. Like there was a lot going on between 12 and 13 where sure. you just kind of, you know, it's stop doing things that are silly and crazy and whatever, um, that to drive to fit in. So from that time until maybe five years ago, and even then, even five years ago, I was still very quiet about it. And, and that's part of how I talk about intuition in my course. There's a reason that I talk about it the way I talk about it, because sometimes it is a direct message. Sometimes I'm getting a direct message that this horse is like, I don't know why they can't figure this out. I keep telling them, yeah. right? You know, and, and so I want people to know that one, if this has happened to you, it's not crazy. Two, you can hone this skill. It is a skill to be honed. So I shut it down for, gosh, 10, 15, almost 20 years. That took time, one, to be confident enough to acknowledge it and to believe in myself that it was real and that it was useful information. And then three, it took even longer to get to the point where now I'm willing to talk about it. Let's talk about it. Because there's also that judgment out there where they're like, well, the animal communicator on TikTok talks about how this horse really wants to let the owner know that they really like to go on rides down here or they don't like that saddle or they'd like a different kind of food. And the way that they're conversating, I certainly can't do that. Okay. Well, everybody can do it a little bit differently. And I don't ever say that I just get sentences that come across my mind that I, you know, it's not always like that. And that's why we talk, I want people to understand that there is a science behind this level of communication. And that's that perception. We don't always perceive it. You don't always understand it, but you, you have more senses than, and more sensitivity to your senses than you are willing to acknowledge. Exactly. Which is yes. why I tell every horse owner, you are the best person to heal your horse. This is why I encourage people to take my certification program. Even if they're like, I never want to run a business. Okay, but do you want to continue to own horses and watch them excel? Do you want to create that kind of communication and relationship with your horse? Do you want your horse to start to have a problem, but before it even becomes a problem that anyone else notices, you know about it and you fix it, right? Like, but I did create a program that if you also want to ditch your nine to five and go kick ass in business, you're going to do that too, because everybody that buys my certification program automatically gets the business building course for free with it. Beautiful. Because doesn't that just make sense? Like, absolutely. 
if you're going to become certified because you want a business, someone should tell you how to do a business. Correct. That was part of my certification. It, it was a two year certification. Like you can get a coaching certification in a weekend, right? Yeah, but not this, same. not this kind of certification. It's uh -huh. the most comprehensive of its kind. And I was glad yeah. for that. But we also did get business development as well. Well, and, and here's what I can say to that. There is a the program that I took claimed to have business and marketing involved in it. And when I, okay, also serial entrepreneur since the time I graduated high school, right? I am no stranger to business strategy. Also, I have a degree in business administration. Again, I took college courses in marketing. And when I, you know, before I took that certification, I was already looking at coaches online that were teaching business, people that had started with nothing, living homeless in a car and became a millionaire because they knew what they were doing strategically in business. I followed multiple people of that kind. So when I got to the business portion of that certification program and they're like, go make flyers and go to Barnes and talk to people. I'm like, what the is this? <laughs> like that's, I mean, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that my strategy is way more complex than that. It's not. It's not about the strate the strategy behind it. It's that we need to put the mindset with the strategy to take actionable steps. Exactly. And and that's not what that program provided. So they claim to have business in there, but I can tell you that my business program is an additional six months on top of it. And it's not because it takes six months to grow the business. And you do start it before you finish your certification so that as soon as you're certified, you're already booking clients because that just makes sense, right? But yeah. that's all part of it. It's all part of it. Nice. Well, I, I'll tell you, I could, we could, Margaret, I could like go make a plate of dinner and a <laughs> cup of coffee and we could go on for hours i we are definitely going to do this again if you're up for it totally because i told you I, I talk a lot <laughs> i love it oh my gosh this has been such a wonderful wonderful i don't even know how long we've been on but it flew it but did. i do i do have one more question to ask you actually i do have a few more but we're going to save those for our our part two sounds good what advice would you give to horse owners who feel like they've hit a roadblock with their horse, whether it's due to an injury, behavior, or any other limitations? And how can they begin to make those small, simple changes that you mentioned can make a world of difference? First and foremost, don't stop looking. Don't stop believing that it's possible to see a change. As soon as we stop believing that change is possible, our brains automatically stop looking for answers. So don't stop believing that the answer is out there. And remember that every time you open yourself up to finding an answer, you come one step closer. And sometimes the, the answer, <laughs> you said something at the beginning of this. Oh, the 10 light, the 10 light. You were like, I was already thinking of red light. And then boom, I show up and you're like, well, there's a link, I'm gonna buy it, right? It's that easy when we allow it to be, right? We have to allow for that ease and flow. It gets to be easy. And when you're talking about making these changes, yeah, it gets to be easy in making the changes too because they get to be small. We get to remember that when we make one degree of change, <laughs> that one degree right here is going to be huge over time. I'm um, more alignment, right? To the choir. Oh my gosh. When I coach, I coach the slight edge. Yeah. That's yeah. how I live. My, that is the philosophy behind my success and everything is that, nope, I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm taking the 1% every single day, but I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. I'm, and, and you and know, what's comes. funny, what's funny about that too, is like, when we look at successful people, we can say that there's, you know, 1% of the population is a successful entrepreneur, is a millionaire, is 1%, right? Those one percenters are making 1% changes every day. Indeed. So if you want to be a one percenter, if you want your horse to feel amazing, take a 1% change. Ask yourself every day, how can I 
always asking those how questions so that we're activating our prefrontal cortex, not asking why is this like this and putting ourselves back into our limbic system, our lizard brain, our stress responses, right? Yeah. Like we don't want to be there. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. You are so, I swear, we, we must've come out of the same mother. <laughs> <laughs> this is me. This, I studied brain-based strategy. I studied limbic I told you, I'm not a people person, but I don't mind working with people. And it's because I worked with myself first. So you'll hear me talk about that a lot too. So really, if you're like, I don't know what to do. If, if there's a horse owner out there, they're like, there's all this crap going on with my horse that I don't know what to do. First step is regulate yourself. First step is deal with your own emotional stuff because it's going to become so much easier for you to recognize what's going on with your horse and the messages that the horse is trying to tell you when you're familiar with what that emotion looks and feels like. And the only way you're going to do that is by feeling it and observing it yourself. So that's where you start. You start with you. I know everybody's like, that doesn't fix my horse's problem. Okay. Well, if that's how you feel about it, that's when you come to my Facebook group and you post those five pictures and we have a 20 minute call and I can help you in that direction. But it always starts with you first. You want a good relationship with your horse? You better have a good relationship with you. Oh my goodness. I could not have said it any better than that. I'm so grateful to you, Margaret, that you offer this. You offer all these options. You are a wealth of knowledge. I know that our listeners and viewers are going to walk away with a lot to think about and actions to take. I it's thank the you. actions. You're very welcome. And what would make me feel good is to know that all those listen listeners out there go out and implement, right? We've had a great conversation. Hopefully we've sparked some ideas, but unless we go out and implement on those ideas, which might just be popping a search in the search bar <laughs> on Google, right? <laughs> unless you go out and implement, they're not going to help you. So please go out and take action. And remember, like for all of your listeners, I want everybody to remember too, that you are the best person to heal your horse and you have everything you need to do that already. You just have to believe in yourself. Beautiful, beautifully said. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. And I look Thank forward you. to our next. Me too. This has been great. I'm glad we connected. Same. Divine. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We will see you soon. See you later. Take care.